once again good evening everyone i do hope you can hear me i need um confirmation from you all to just affirm that you can hear me very well please confirm if you can hear me okay good let me just confirm you can hear me Huluashe, good to have you vanessa good 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 so we can kick off we can kick off um all right the lack of to confirm that that's good all right once again good evening um today uh we will reviewing some of the content we have for february 2024 um in the course of the month uh we shared a number of content across um accounting auditing taxation and some topical issue in um, HR. Um, together with me to discussing this today uh, shall be some of my colleagues from PCP. Uh, we have the very first person, it's um, by name Olami Likon. I prefer to call him, him cousin. Um, second, it's Afala Shade. Then, um, Third is Ola BC, and um, uh, the last but not the least is uh, Vanessa. Um, in the course of the week, for those who have been following us consistently, we issued a topic in uh, on auditing. Uh, who can bring us to speed on what that topic is and a brief of what you you learned? Uh, haven't gone through the, the content. Anyone? Anyone who could bring us to speed on the content we published on auditing? Any volunteer? Please, as much as possible, let's make this session very, very engaging. Is there anyone who would like to confirm to us, having gone through our content in the course of the month, what we shared in um, February 2024? All right, I believe I, I think some people are feeling shy. Um, let me just kick off immediately. Um, cousin, let me start with you. Can you give us a brief, very, very brief? Um, an introduction to what um, we release as a content in 2024 February. Is cousin there? Um, yes, I'm here. All right. My listeners is awaiting your response. Just a brief in terms of what we publish as a content on auditing in 2024 February. Okay, um we're talking about um um it's a 510 right absolutely go 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 ahead very brief okay so um uh, good evening everyone uh, my name is cousin Olamilopin and today I'll be talking about um initial audit engagement um opening balances um as the name implies um opening balances is what we actually know um, um that it is so opening balances is just basically the balance that is being brought forward from the previous period to the current period say for instance um if we are in 2021 and um we are to audit um the accounts of from january 1st 2021 to 31st of december then the opening balance for that particular period will be the balance as at 1st of january 2021 so the audit of opening balances is um very important um when we are talking about the audit of um financial statements so in this slide audit is divided into three major parts which is the planning stage and um also we have the engagement stage when the audit is actually being performed and um, we have when the audit is getting to, near to um completion so in line with um um it's at 200 and um uh it's a 210 and also it's at 300 that specifically talk about the planning of 
an audit of audit engagement. So ITA Pack then is specifically concerned about a specific area of, of the planning of audit engagement, which is um, opening balances. So basically, the scope of um, ISA uh, 510 is to talk about the responsibility of the auditor in relation to audit of opening balance in an initial engagement. So um, this standard is focusing on an initial engagement when an auditor is taking up an engagement for the very first time. Say, for instance, um, we have an audit, um, audit engagement for 2022 and um, the, the company in question has been audited in 2021 prior to that period um, by another auditor which is called predecessor auditor. So um, the concern of this standard is when an auditor is picking up an engagement or being engaged in a complaint to be their statutory auditor for the, for the very first time. So that is the scope, the entire scope of this audit um, for the um, opening uh, initial audit engagement opening balances. So, and also the objective of this standard um, is to ensure that uh, the auditor obtains sufficient appropriate evidence about whether opening balances contain material misstatements that affect the current um, period financial statement. You will agree with me that um, when an auditor is signing um, for an audit engagement of a particular period, say 2020 for instance now, the auditor is not only signing for the um, for the financials of 2020 alone, so in line with IAS 1, that the auditor, uh, the financial statement should be presented um, cooperatively with the previous period. Which simply means that if we are in 20, if we are, audit, if we are auditing 2023 or we are presenting an account for 2023, it comes with a cooperative which is on, on the 2020. So the auditor is not only issuing an opinion for just 2023, but also the cooperative. So this is a risk on the part of the new auditor, call it a new auditor, uh, to ensure that um, it ob he obtain appropriate sufficient evidence about the opening balances in terms of uh, whether there is a material misstatement coming from the previous period to the current period that will affect the financials of the current period. And also to ensure that um, accounting policy has been consistently applied or where there is a change, this particular change has been disclosed and accounted for. So what do we mean by accounting? Okay, pause him. Um, let me hold it there. Um, just to put perspective to things, um, in the course of the month, just like my colleague uh, did FM, we made a publication on ISA 510, and the essence of the standard, we will be discussing that today, we'll also look at the objective of the standard. <clears throat> Why do we have ISA 510? What is the relevance of the standard? what are the related standards to the standard but before we even start at all um for the benefit of those who might not have audit background um i like cousin to just briefly tell them what isa means oh okay so isa is a international standard on auditing so it is a framework that guides the auditor um in the course of uh performing the audit of uh financial statements okay it is right. more like what we can look at outside audit says are like a guideline a guideline a total package that is a, a total guideline for an auditor in carrying out um the audit of um financial statements that is okay. what uh, thank you thank you very much uh so for clarity to that um the same way when you have a lawyer a lawyer for uh, for a lawyer to discharge its or her responsibility, uh, you will agree with me that they make reference to the various constitutions and the laws of the jurisdiction within, within which they are um, actually addressing, right? For an accountant to address any concern, they will make reference to uh, what we call uh, accounting standard. But in the case of um, an auditor, the point of reference most of the time is what we call ESA. And ESA means International uh, Standard on Auditing. All right. Um, secondly, um, there are so many standards on, um, there are so many uh, auditing standards we have. 
Uh, but today we will be concentrating on ISA 510. What is the relevance of ISA 510? Right? Um, I know that um, Cousin have given some background to that, but for better clarity, let's look at it from the accounting perspective. Um, when financial statements are prepared, what are the components of financial statements? I want um, OLABC to address that, please. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. My name is Oladu Shola. And um, I'll be I'll be accessing the accounting department this evening. So the component of a uh, statement and statement of financial position, statement of cash flow, statement of progressive income, and statement of equity. And um, in, in, in when we are trying to use the components, they are mostly guided by IFRS in the preparation of the financial report. The component of the financial statement, just like uh, BCA firm, should be the statement of financial position, which is what we often call the balance sheet, the statement of uh, profit or loss, which we often call the trading profit and loss account before now. Uh, we have the statement of changes in equity, which is a statement that shows um, the stake of the shareholders um, in the company and the of this uh, from period to period. Uh, we have the statement of cash flows too, which reconcile the liquid cash that uh, cash and cash equivalent uh, which in a layman's view we can call the liquid cash that um, the business start up with how much of it has been generated in addition to the startup fund and um, what portion of this has been spent in the period and um, what is left but we will logically link this to a topic of um, of discussion under auditing, which is the ISA 510. When auditors are out to audit any entity, they are out with an intention to expressing um, independent or unbiased opinion about how well the company has prepared its financials, right? Um, there are two instances where um, a company is just being audited for the first time or in another instance where um, the company had been audited by a formal auditor but for one reason or the other the company find it um, necessary to actually change its auditor or in a very real location or in your current location where you have the same auditor coming in the subsequent period coming in the subsequent period to auditing the financials of the current period now, what is the relevance of ISA 510? ISA 510 emphasizes that while auditors are preparing, I mean, doing their audit planning for the purpose of the audit, there are very essential um, components of that financial statement that they will have to concentrate on. One of those essential parts is the statement of financial position. Why is this very relevant? It is so relevant because the balances or the figures you have in this component actually flows to the subsequent period. Because of this, it is important that the auditor must certify that these balances are as accurate as possible. Right. So that will inform my next question to Cousin. Um, in the case you are on, you are part of the audit team to audit a company, say ABC, right? And you find out that on reviewing the um, the opening balances, you find out that there are some balances there that are, are they, that are not as accurate as they ought to be. What is the provision of the standard in addressing this sort of concern? Um, okay, so um, for this kind of concern. Um, first of all, before the auditor could ascertain that um, 
the cash and cash some of the cash and cash are not as accurate as it should be it must be that uh, the auditor has act, the auditor have actually carried out a proce procedure whether at the preliminary stage to ascertain or to confirm these um, balances so the first step the auditor will take when such um, come to the notice of the auditor is that uh, the auditor is going to determine the extent of uh, the extent of um, of um, effect on the current period say for instance the auditor must um, determine the materiality that is the material impact of um, discrepancy in the balance as at the beginning of the period we are auditing as against the the closing balance uh, of, of the previous period so for the benefit of um, some of us who are not accountants or auditor here when we say materiality materiality in accounting on it, or in auditing simply means that um, <clears throat> um any um event or occurrence or item that could have an impact in the decision of anybody that is using the financial statements that is in the lemma time say for instance now let me just give a simple example um for the sake of uh, a quoted company a very big company let's assume that um and the cost of say um generator what um forty thousand era or fifty thousand era is not disclosed in the financials we would know that that particular omission or obstruction is not going to affect the decision of uh, of any users or, 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 or of that financial statement so the auditor for the first step the auditor has to take is to determine the materiality that, right that is the the, the extent of the effect of that discrepancy between the opening balance and the actual closing balance so after determining the extent of the materiality say for instance the transaction the, trans the balance rather the difference rather appears to be material then the auditor needs to carry out an additional procedure to confirming um the reason uh, uh the reason for such discrepancies in order to know the appropriate um appropriate opinion to to issue on that financial statement all right thank you cousin thank you very much so what um cousin is trying to emphasize is that uh when you are auditing um the financials of any company it is essential that you adhere to the provision of is 510 for the benefit of those who join us later than we started this isa is international standard on auditing and I did emphasize that every activities of the auditor in the course of every audit process is regulated by one form of ESA or the other. We also did affirm that one of the set of um, activities that the auditor should do on commencing an audit is to review the start off point, right? Um, ESA 510 may not be relevant if you are auditing a company for the very first time and the company uh is just starting um the business or is in its first year because obviously there is no proud balances you are reviewing but this standard is more relevant in an instance where you have uh, an existing company that have been in business for more than a year and the subsequent year that you want to audit um, you want to be sure that the disclosures as contained <clears throat> in the statement of financial position, which serve as the opening balance in, this, in the subsequent period, are as correct as possible. Now, in the course of the auditor doing this, there are instances that you will find out that the balances, some of the balances may be wrong, and some of those balances may entirely be right. So the area you addressed earlier is instance where you find out that one or two of those balances were actually wrong. What then would you do as the auditor? So in his response, he did affirm that you need to look at how significant, how relevant is that component, is that element of the statement of financial position that is wrong. So if you then determine that it is highly significant then there are certain processes that you need to do right in determining the significance um you need to look at a couple of other standards that helps us to unravel what we call what we interpret as being significant 
so you have what we call is at 320 which is the audit standard on audit materiality it helps you the the audit terminology for something that is very significant is materiality so when something is significant we say in audit that it is very very material and to determine what is material compared to what is not you look at is a 320 maybe in a subsequent um, uh, episode we'll definitely look at some of these standards that we are making reference to when you then confirm that an item of the uh, opening balance is actually very material how then do we um address it you have to make reference to another standard that guides you on assessing the extent of the misstatement that could have occurred by reason of that um, error or inconsistency in the account and that is isa 450 in future we'll also look at isa 450 it's a 450 is the standard of evaluating the misstatement identified during the audit of a financial statement then um where you find out that oh it is within the material uh, materiality threshold and it is found out to be actually um resulting in um a misstatement you could then address um the concern within the ambit of the provision of isa 705 isa 705 is the modification to the opinion in the independent auditors report so we'll look at some of these um references in the course of our presentation today but we've been saying we'll be making reference to um components of the financial statement just as bc addressed earlier and we've also um, emphasized that some of the contents of these components of the financial statement may also be found to have been misstated uh bc i will be back to you again um i need you to explain to our audience uh, some of the items of the statement of the um, financial position that may that the auditor will be expected to review when conducting his audit process in line with isa 510 what are the, some of the components i mean uh, content of the statement of financial position oh i think alex wants to address that alex over to you yes uh good evening everyone yeah good evening good evening uh uh, uh i was starting in for all abc for the meantime currently it's possible okay so uh some of the content uh that some of the content that uh, the auditor is expected to review in the course of uh, them doing their work as a result of opening balance discrepancies are uh are uh, uh, are uh, one they are visible they are mostly attached to the statement of the financial position uh, which is also known as the balance sheet so and on the balance sheet we have current items such as the the non-current assets the current assets the equity the non current the current liability and the non-current liability so and uh, they are their items if you are to break those items down you know that uh, the non current asset here have the ppe that is the property plant and equipment the under the current asset you have cash and cash inventory uh, the trade receivables then the equity share capital the, under the court the, the liability sections you have the, the debts the accrued expenses and all other and the retained end so in the course of the auditor trying to carry out the assessment they're expected to look at every item that is presented on the statement of the balance sheet alex thank you so much thank you so much um let me go back to cousin again cousin alex has identified to us that um some of the content of the opening balance you will be reviewing uh are content that are contained in the statement of financial position in its words to identify assets and give example of what should be there like the ppe the investments the cash in hand the cash at bank the receivables and the likes it did also identify that you could have elements of liabilities there which could be payables bank overdrafts and the likes and some component of equity there 
let's pick one and walk our audience through on what you will do if you want to review uh, one of these components. Uh, can you walk our audience through if you have identified, you want to um, perform um, the requirement, the audit procedure in line with ISA 510 on an item of PP? How do you walk it through to determine whether the balances are actually correct, they are appropriate, they are consistent, and the likes? What would you do? Walk our audience through, please. Okay, um, thank you so much um, for that question. Um, first of all, uh, we want to uh, bring to the understanding of the audience that um, what we are looking at currently is the audit of opening balances and not for the uh, for the period, uh, whatever period in concern. So in this slide, if we are looking at um, PP, don't forget that we said this uh, standard focus or concentrate on um, what's called on, it concentrate on initial opening balance that is the one of which the current auditor was not the auditor in the prior period right so the first step to take is um to review the working paper of the presidential auditor that is the auditor the retiring auditor we call it the retiring auditor which is the former auditor before the current auditor so the standard that provides um a guideline about um um, audit working paper is um, um, ISA 230 uh, uh, audit documentation. So, but that's not where we are going. First of all, if you want to um, uh, collect evidence or we want to ascertain that uh, the opening balance of PPE is um, actually uh, being stated correctly in the account. So, the first thing we have to look at is that we have to first look at the recognition of that PPE. So uh, through the work paper, we are going to understand the recognition of the PPE, whether all the associated cost that is meant to be capitalized has been capitalized. So in line with reviewing the working paper of the previous um, auditor, and also to, to review the evidences that has been gathered in the prior period as well. So um, also this is what something we call accounting policy. So accounting policy are those um, policy that is either um, being mandatory by the standard or elected by the company in question um, to apply on an item of financial statement. Say for instance, let me use the PPE that um, we are talking about. Um, in PPE now, if you have selected the cost model, in PPE we have two options. Either we are using the um, the cost. Awesome. Model. Let me hold you there. So sorry. Um, we have somebody who raised his hand for a while. I think I joined Kababa today. Is he still there? Okay, I think his network is not too consistent. Um, I would not want you to be too technical because there are, of course, people here who entire who are not entirely auditors. So let me help in simplifying that. Um, assuming you are an auditor and you are on an audit engagement, you want to review an item of PPE to be sure that. Um, the balances that have been stated in the prior year is reliable enough for you to continue the audit in the current year. First of all, you will want to ascertain what is the balance stated in that item, or I mean, in that um, component of the account. You want to relate that with um, the relevant note in that prior year's account, which is the item of. Um, fixed asset um, schedule right you want to do some reperformance calculation or test there to be double sure that what the prior auditor has calculated is as appropriate as it should be then from there um you know certain depreciation rates must have been used you want to relate that also with um the accounting policy right uh what is the accounting policy with regards to recognition of an asset what is their policy with regards to depreciation of that very item of assets so you want to do some performance test on that then um finally in a very simplified way you also want to ascertain um that item of um 
PPE that have been reported as assets of the company, was it actually owned by the company? So we want to test the ownership test. I mean, we want to assess whether um, the company actually has certain rights on that very asset, right? If after you are able to validate that, then it means that that amount or those balances uh, is substantial and relevant enough um to be considered in the subsequent period right but if it is not substantial enough or you find out that oh a company has the precision and asset they use the right the precision rate right but you find out that that item of asset is not actually owned by that very company uh what you would then have to do will be in line with those standards that i have earlier referenced i did reference is a 320 which is to determine how material it, that amount has been um determine um the extent of the misstatement that particular recognition could have caused in line with is a 450 then determine the impact of that on your audit opinion whether that will inform you uh, modifying the opinion that will have been given to i mean that will have been expressed in regards to that item of um of um the financial statement right i believe everybody understand that what we have explained thus far if there is any question please um you can signify um by the raising of hand to ask your question or you simply use the chat box to um raise any of your concern don't forget today or uh, under auditing we are looking at is a 510 right um i quickly want to deviate a little bit to taxation how does um tax have impact on all the conversation we've been having thus far um our publication on tax this i mean this month centers on uh after filing after you must have filed your annual returns annual pe returns what next um Shade will be taking us on that briefly not more than two minutes give our audience some level of understanding that okay you filed your annual returns what next do you have to do as a task accountant Shade, over to you guys. okay good evening everyone so after we must have filed annual pay returns which must have been filed on the 31st of january the following year we must understand that we must understand that we have we have the eligibility to apply for task clearance task clearance certificates from the service and also the tax the tax authority also have the eligibility to give to assess the company that has already filed their payee returns either as a way of desk review or tax audit. All right, thank you, Falashadi. Uh, what Falashadi is trying to say in it is that um, remember in January, uh, companies in Nigeria are expected to file in their annual tax returns, right? And this annual tax return relates strictly to uh companies that has uh, employees in the employment of that company and have incurred or paid a certain consideration at salary or other working benefits so she emphasized that oh if you have filed your returns whether with um, the legal state internal revenue service or any of the other states within the jurisdictions in nigeria next thing you are to do is to proceed to filing uh, what we call uh i mean to process what we call the tax clearance certificate please tell our audience again tax clearance certificate what does it actually mean shadi over to you okay so tax clearance certificate means that a person or an individual has already met the requirements for that certificate is showing that the person has complied throughout the year for paying the payee that has passed pay as you earn for making the payment to the relevant tax authority. All right, thank you very much, Shadi. I sometimes see um 
and observe that many people misuse this expression pay as you earn pay me with what we call the personal income tax pit what is the difference between the two is there any difference and how can we actually um when should we actually apply pay or use the expression pay compared to that of the pit Okay, um, Biodu wants to address that. Biodu, over to you, please. So, good evening, everyone. Yeah. Okay, so the word personal income tax actually has to do with... Um, Biodu, you might need to speak up a little bit. Um, if I'm struggling to hear you here, I believe other people may not have been okay. able to hear you. Here. All right, thank you very much. Please confirm if you can hear me now. Yeah, much better. Okay, so the work of uh, personal income tax has actually has to do with the transaction of um, individuals. You agree with me that in Nigeria as a whole, we our taxation in Nigeria is actually divided into two. We have the corporate taxes and we have the personal taxes. So the personal income taxes has to do with the taxation of people that are not um, in quotes and unquote limited liability company of people that are not incorporated by the CAC, by the CAC that's the corporate affairs combination. So the uh, the term used for taxes of people that are, that are not incorporated is what we call the personal income tax. So this has to do with taxes of people like super proprietorship. I remember last month we talked about super proprietorship. So the taxes of people like the super proprietorship, the partnership are being um classified under what we call the personal income tax the taxes of individuals um employees employer um i net for people the directors are being classified under what we call the personal income tax why the pay as your head as the name implied means um in a simple form it's a deduction at source so that means for, for income as you are earning your income even before the income is being um is being paid to the um to the employees the taxes are being deducted so it means pay as you earn before you earn the income the taxes are being deducted as a source so what are the um set of people that are being grouped under the pay as you earn these are people that are under a um, what we call the contracts of service they are under um an employment of a particular company so in nigeria employers who are employer who, who employ you to labor certain the services of certain people have been given the obligation to deducting um taxes from their employees income before they pay the certain taxes to the employee so the deduction of this taxes is what we call the pay as you earn but the pay as you earn let me just say the pay as you earn is a subset of the personal income tax the personal right, thank income you, Welcome, thank sir. you very thank you very much Biodun. um so to put a much more broader uh, clarity to this uh when you say pay as you earn just like Biodun has said it's mostly attributable to employment income in employment income you are expected to earn your income either on day-to-day -day basis or weekly basis or monthly basis in nigeria um employment income or employees are mostly remunerated on a monthly basis right those are that is what is very much common and that is why most people may think that uh, uh pay as you earn it's only related to um monthly earnings no anyone who, who is in a contract of employment um the appropriate tax on that income is called pay as you earn but it's also possible for somebody someone who is on who is being subjected to tax on pay system to still have certain obligation relating to pit so what then is pit the concept of PIT is more broader. Um, it is expected to help uh, break within the tax net those uh, who are in their self-employment or running the business of theirs uh, 
to actually have an avenue to be obligated to paying their taxes to you and why is that people who run their business most of the time may not um, have earnings on a monthly basis or weekly basis or day-to-day -day basis as um, a regular employee will have been obligated to right so that address that part but it's also possible for somebody who is in a regular monthly um earning or employment to also have other streams of income and as a good citizen if you want to then disclose those additional income you are expected to filing that tax under pit pay i mean uh, personal income tax so in a nutshell um while pay as you earn relate entirely to uh, anyone within a contract of employment um pit relates to people who may be in a contract of employment in addition but still have other sources of income or someone uh who has um simply what we is actually running a business of theirs so take note of that we have a question on the chat box and i'll quickly like to address that quickly i did call her a farm that um she said um he or she i don't know will appreciate if we can explain the difference between dex review and tax audit as a process towards obtaining tax clearance uh Biodu or shade would you like to take that up okay they don't want to take that up. over to you Chris. okay so um for tax review okay let me start by saying lirs or firs okay let me not use LIRS. let me use this word any state internal revenue service or the federal internal inland revenue service have different sections of um in the in the organization for her firs we have um the tax um and processing units that's a TPS, a TPS. These are the first set of people that you meet when you go to any tax station. They are the ones to take in your information, they are the ones to attend to you, like the job of any receptionist in a company. In a company, then we have a schedule officer. So, for every company, you are being assigned to a schedule officer. This schedule officer are the one in charge of your day to day compliances. So, when you file your um whatever it may be probably your um, um what's it called now your payee your pay pay as your hand and not its own or probably your um complaint filing this schedule officer has charged with the responsibility of doing a check on what you found let's not forget that in nigeria we want what we call a self-assessment basis that means as a taxpayer you are giving the open hand to fully assess yourself to tax on what you deem fit is the actual tax you are expected to pay for the period so after you might have done your self-assessment for the period the the schedule officer that has been assigned to your file has the sole responsibility of checking if what you've done if you've been if you've complied adequately to the um, provision of the law that is backing your compliance so the review at the schedule officer level it is what we call the dex review assessments this is a review at the schedule officer level so for tax audits there is another department within the confine of the re 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 revenue authority that are being called the tax audit and investigation unit so these are set of people that after you might have filed your return probably after two three two to three years they have the, the duty to audit what you've done to audit your filing to see if um there is no undisclosed income to check if your filing is um being done in line with all the sections of the law and to check the adequacy of your filing so the re reviews by this department is what we call tax so this so this is to say that even after your your schedule officer might have even done its own his own um dex review to to ascertain that yes you comply with the regulatory authority this tax audit still have the responsibility to auditing your 
uh, your books, your your finding to be sure that to ascertain of the truth that you've complied with every necessary things you have to comply with. So I would say the tax audit overrides the tax review um, exercise. But all of this exercise is just to ensure that you comply with the regulatory authority. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, thank you very much. Um, you will all agree with me that whether you are an auditor, you are a financial accountant, or you are a tax accountant, there is something that is common to us all, is a concept of being skeptical uh, in every of our uh, professional dealings. We have this uh, inquisitive mindset that something may still be wrong, right? As Biodu said, um, the system in Nigeria allows all taxpayers to self-assess themselves and file the returns, right? So um, the first stage of affirming the appropriateness of what you have filed is what we call the DEX review. It is not very thorough. It's just to check in the compliance on the peripheral. How adequate is your disclosure of um, income? How appropriate are those um, tax reliefs that you have get, you have claimed? And how accurate is the tax due that you have paid? Have you even paid it at all? Right? On value addition basis, um, the tax office may then decide to take a step further to even check whether there is a need for you or it is economically viable for you for them to carry out a much more thorough exercise which we call the tax audit i believe some people have reason to um questioning this process because um sometimes a taxpayer will have been given a tax clearance certificate and yet there will be an intention to carry out tax audit again so if i were not to be um, a tax man i would also have queried the process how come you have cleared me and you're still coming back uh, to um tax auditing me so it is a law that actually avails them that very opportunity to um, check compliance as much as possible and the all intent the all intention is just to ensure that uh, every liable person discharge as appropriate as possible what is due on the tax um, income yes yeah, somebody else asked again that um, can an employer request for tax clearance of employees after filing annual returns and a dex review conducted and found okay of course you can um i, I think uh, falashade even affirmed that that immediately you have finished um filing your annual returns the next uh, set of activity expected of you is to engage um, the relevant tax authority especially at the state level requesting for um the tax clearance certificate of your employees each of the states has um protocol or process by which you should follow to um, um guarantee the issuance of this so you might need to check with the state under consideration i know of lagos uh, very well the system is much more automated it's um it's possible that if your remittances is adequate and every other thing is in order you most likely will have it much more automated um other states are coming up i think ogo state also has something similar to that but in this in the other states that are yet to automate their system you might need to uh, make a formal application to addressing that all right um before we go to other areas i quickly want to bring to the remembrance of everyone that um this episode of this public engagement is anchored by kcp right kcp is a firm of chartered accountant uh we offer accounting services tax services audit services regulatory services training what you are enjoying is uh one of the components of the training services we offer to our will be interested um audience right so i want i urge you to make um, the best of it ask as many questions as possible on a regular basis we make um publications on topical issues in the practice and we share it across our various um, social media platforms uh, engage meaningfully with it and uh, why are we doing this uh, we identified certain uh, professional gap competency gap in practice and uh, we desire to make our own contribution to um, bridging those gaps we also identify or want to create room 
um, for those um, newly coming into the profession to give them certain leverage and insight into what they should expect after studies or after training, right? Then we want to create um, an avenue for everyone, whether you are top notch in your processes or you are still trying to find in, um, your feet in practice, we want to give an, an avenue to everyone where we can actually rub our skills and competence on each other, all in the name of doing the profession proud. I'm sure um, you, um, this session is actually uh, meeting this, the intended objective. Um, so I will, if there is no other question based on what we have discussed thus far, I quickly want to go to the next um, guest for today, Vanessa. Vanessa is, I mean, Andrew's um, HR um, service, services of the firm. Um, she, um, in line with our HR content, there is a publication and I want her to um, enlightening the public, um, the audience on this within the next two minutes. Vanessa, over to you. Okay, thank you, sir. Good evening, everybody. My name is Vanessa Martins. Um, in the past week, um, we've been able to publish a content with topic on um, the difference between contract of service and and contract for service. So there are there are, there are differences and there are similarities um, for this. So a lot of a lot of um, employers um, tend to miss this um, this um, contract for service and contract of service. So a lot of people tend to miss the difference and similarities because they tend to sound alike. If you can all hear me, can you please? Maybe a thumbs up. I'm sorry if there's any feedback. Okay, thank you. So, um, what do we mean by contract of service? Contract of service. Now, contract of service is an agreement between an employer and an employee, right? Whereby, whereby an employer has agreed to provide necessary benefits in exchange for services from the employee now let me explain in a layman um, understanding now a contract for service is like an employment letter or a contract form right whereby a staff or a, a, an applicant that has applied for job and has been offered the job offer or the job position is giving like an um, like a contract form to sign that oh i'm responsible to provide these services maybe you are being employed for customer service as an example right you are here to 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 sell products to customers right okay so you are you when 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 you've been um when you've applied for the job you've been offered the job you are to sign like a document saying that okay for the time being for my time here in whatever firm that i am i'm here to provide the service of customer service in quotes and at the end of the month your employer in exchange of your services gives you remuneration gives you bonuses or whatever um, thing that is due to you right and every everything that is due to you is all stated in your contract of service i hope you can get me now contract for service contract for service mind you they sound alike but they are actually different the first one is contract of service while this is contract for service now what is contract for service contract for service is an agreement between an employer or a service provider and a client that okay for this period of time maybe in three months in six months you are expected to provide this service for my organization and at the end of the month or at the end of those period of time you are being compensated for that you are given uh, maybe in your agreement letter there are um, provisions that okay this is what is due you for the service provided let us give it an example as we did the previous one okay now um 
we are a we are let's assume KCP is an HR, HR consulting firm. We consult for other companies. We help them in their recruitment processes. We help them in finding suitable suitable um, employees for other organizations. Now, a third party, a third party named, let us just give a name, Vanessa's company, is in need of 10, 10 auditors, right? And okay, I do not have HR in my field, or let's say um, it's a small sized business. Now you consult KCP, which is a, is a HR or a human resource consulting firm. Okay, KCP, I need 10 auditors, right? KCP takes it in their power to do what? To recruit for you. And before the recruitment commences, there is an agreement that is to be signed between KCP and Vanessa's company. That at the end of this particular month, at the end of two weeks, at the end of three weeks, I'm expected to provide 10 auditors for Vanessa's company. And at the end of that um, um, service, I am to pay KCP a sum of this a sum of that so that is what is called contract for service i hope we can now distinguish um, the difference between con contract of service and contract for service the first one is between an employer and an employee while the other one is between a client and a service provider hope we can get it okay yeah, so Mar there's Marisa, oh, hold on there thank you very much i, I believe uh everyone uh did understand that uh contract of service is when you are in a paid employment right the employer have full control of the form and the nature of the services you are to Marisa, please move So um, the employer is in, in the control of when you would offer the service, how you will offer the service, the mode of the offering and all of that. That is a contract of service. For contract for service um, is a form of um, professional engagement uh, between two distinct entities, just as she has referenced, right? I know this is something that um, uh, a lot of accountants in practice do face every time and it does have a tax implication right so at this time i want to come back to uh Abiodun to tell us if you have a contract for service engagement what is the tax implication within the purview of our tax law and if you have a contract of service what is the tax implication so that our audience when they encounter similar thing they will know how best to address it thank you okay thank you very much sir so if you have a contract for employment just as vanessa has explained that contract um your the um the contractor and the contract e are independent of each other that means um the contract gives um the terms of the contract is such is uh, is as just such as the person contracting the service does not have any obligation rather than remuneration to be paid to the contractor so now for this the implication of this is that um the contractor the contractor don't have any obligation so as regards the payment of payee on behalf of the um contracting the only impl tax implication in this line is the deduction of what we call the withholding tax that means the person um contracting out the service as the obligation to withhold a certain amount it ranging from five to ten percent depending on who the um client is now from the fee of the clients before paying it out to the clients why contract of of employment is that one in which the employer the employee is dependent on the employer for uh, to discharge any services on behalf of the employer that means the employer has the sole obligation of deducting at source any deduction that is expected to be deducted from the employer's fee such as 
in, in, with intact related form now we call that is where the pay as you earn comes in such as the pay as you earn the pension deduction the nhf deduction so for contracts of employment now the employer will be held responsible for the um for discharging the tax um, the tax compliances of the employee why for contracts for employment the employer won't be held responsible the responsible the only obligation the employer has to the employee is the deduction of what we call the withholding tax the employee in this form now is as responsibility to discharging its own tax compliance to the government thank you sir All right, thank you, Biodo. Uh, okay, I think somebody has a question. Are they your yeah? Hope I call it right. Uh, please quickly ask your question. Hello. So, good evening. Yeah, good evening. Uh, thank you, KCP, for this wonderful privilege and opportunity. You guys are doing a good work. Yeah, quick one here concerning the withholding tax, and you're talking about the contract for service so let's assume that fine a the client have been in for it meanwhile the PAT is not inclusive and what we say is so so let me say from the client Adi, 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 that, sorry hold on Adi, um, you might need to speak a little bit louder so that everyone can hear you i'm struggling to pick in your words here all right, all right, no problem. Yeah, my question is fine. The let's say the service provider of invoice the is our client, and or, I mean with that invoice, the PAT is not inclusive. Rather, you only put the service charge. Okay, I'm collecting the so amount which was placed there. Without on a norm, there should be a place for PAT where you had them to be the sum amount. On this case now, PAT is exclusive. Would it be? okay or appropriate for the accountant or the client to withhold part of the service provider or uh, renovation thank you or the payment okay thank you very much Mr. Can you address that and then yes. Yes. Oh, yeah, yes. that. thank you very much mr Day. so actually um the the um, position of the tax law as we get regards um the deduction of vat and returning tax are very clear vat returning deduction of returning tax has nothing to do with if um the client has um charged vat on its invoice or not the position of the law is if the contract involved is liable to deduction of returning tax whether vat has been charged or vat has not been charged you are expected to deduct so now you has the um um, um clients you as the um clients in question now invoicing your your service provider has invoiced you and did not charge vat so if you decide not to withhold from the service provider fee on the notion that um the service provides that fee um money is minute and it is you are not expected to be told it you have you now have the responsibility of paying the withholding tax from your own pocket to the government but the position of the law is is, is very clear on this whether the, the service provider has imputed as charged you vat or not you are expected to be told if the transaction in question is liable to be told in tax I hope that answer your question. All right. Um, thank you, Abiodun. Uh, but let me also add a few uh, flesh to that. Um, there are a couple of reasons why you could see certain invoice in the contract for service without a VAT. It could be um, the issuer of that invoice um, is still operating within the threshold that is not vertible, right? It could also be that um, the nature of the service that has been rendered is also VAT exempt. But in the absence of any of those um, condition, um, if uh, an invoice is issued that ordinarily ought to have been vertible and um, VAT has not been included, 
um there is an obligation on the side of the recipient of that invoice to indicating that that is fulfilling your civil obligation to the country that oh this service is vertible right it should have included vat but um just like um Biodu said it has nothing to do with whether uh because of the absence of vat you will not um withhold where such tax base is actually liable to withholding tax so please let's take note of that right withholding tax has to be um, um deducted appropriately at the appropriate rate and remitted within the timeline right please take note of that Biadu, i'm seeing your hands up do you have a question yes i just want to ship it in is this that there is actually a controversy on if complaints are with your vov on, on if complaint which revenue is um within the threshold of zero to 25 million that's of a truth they are not expected they are taxed to cit or at zero percent they are not expected to be zero percent there's actually a controversy on if their transactions to their vendor are expected to be liable to be told in tax so sir i don't know if you can help us shed more light on this okay um you need to first of all take it from this way um last week i think we have a first phase of this um, conversation around um around um the nature or the structure of business in the first instance if i'm operating uh a business operating my business with a business name um technically my obligation is not to FIRS, is to any of the state tax authorities, depending on the residency rule or other circumstances that may be applicable, right? So, if I have a business name and the nature of my service is not vertible or VAT exempt, ordinarily, I have I'm not expect. I mean, I'm expected not to include VAT on my invoice, but that doesn't exempt me from actually been liable to withholding tax and the relevance of that withholding tax is removing the bill the business name the owner of the business when he or she is filing its self-assessment returns all the VA, all the withholding tax that have been deducted from various vendors or customers will then be collated and using offsetting they will be a pit as the case may be but I recognize the contention you, you raised when, uh, with regards to entities that are not liable to CIT and of operating with an, uh, with an incorporated status. Um, you and I are not, we don't have a right to actually um, redraft the intent of the law. There is still a lacuna in the provisions of that law because the law and by the law now i'm referring to the company income tax act section 40 precisely emphasize that uh when your threshold of your revenue is 25 million and below the tax rate is um zero percent but there has not been any clarity technically uh, to addressing the other part of it that since you are not operating within a taxable region you should not be i mean you should um you should not be liable to withholding tax but if i have a client that have raised that very concern um it is technically visible that withholding tax should not be charged right it is something i mean it is an issue that is subject to debate i will expect that um frs or whatever body that is in charge uh we want to refute that but it's something that can be tested for uh, for for substance i mean for a precedence to be established right i hope that is clear yes, sir. thank you very much sir yeah. Are you going to raise your hand again? I think there is another question. Please have the floor. Yes, thank you. Oh, please. What the contention between the we told the I mean yes, you have to say uh, yeah, we told the the condition of okay, are you deducting five percent or ten percent? Can you I mean put more clarity on that please? Can you share more light on that please? 
either you are deducting or I mean at the percentage of five or ten percent, what time the percentage you are using? All right, Biodu, will you want to take that help or you want me to address it? Okay, sir, I'll take it off now. Okay, so um as a task consultant, you know, one of the um so came of a task consultant is to see how we can take charge of the loopholes in tax law to reduce our client tax um to help in our tax um our client tax planning. So the um the question as we get the rates we use whether five percent or ten percent is actually depending on how the transaction is being reported in your financial statements. If the transaction is being reported as service charge, you are expected to be told 10 percent if the vendor in concern is a corporate limited liability company and five percent if the vendor is a um is an individual but if the transaction in concern is being reported as contract then whether it is um like corporate limited liability company or individual you are expected to return five percent thank you all right, so have more clarity to that. Um, what she's trying to say is um, tax practice in Nigeria, as well as most other countries, is actually influenced by the nomenclature you have given to that transaction. So by that, I mean um, sometimes certain people render certain services and call it a different name, right? So um, you will also agree with me that there is no definite law that speaks to chargeability of withholding taxes. So the only legal premise is either traceable to um, the Company Income Tax Act or traceable to the Personal Income Tax Act. And if you look at these laws, it recognizes certain line of transactions or form of transactions as being liable or accruable to withholding tax. For example, we have things around dividend. If you have earned a dividend, whether the dividend is earned by an incorporated entity or an individual or whoever, a business name, it is liable to a flat rate of 10%, right? Um, sometimes you could also have uh, interest as an earning or you have rent as a form of income. These also have a common rate of 10% irrespective of the beneficiary, right? But if you if the earning on that on that contextual is um, um, director's fee or anything of that nature, director's fee, you could have an instance whereby an individual is a director on the board of a company, and you could also have an institutional directors. So where you have an institutional director, it is not liable to withholding tax because it is expected that that particular um, income will still be redistributed to the benefiting um, shareholders. But um, if that particular director's fee is earned by an individual, it is liable to a withholding tax at the rate of 10%. We also have instances where you there is a hiring lease or whatsoever, any uh, form of um, business arrangement in that nature has no respect to whether it is an incorporated entity or an individual. It's a flat rate of 10%. Same thing or similar thing is uh, applicable to royalties. You will agree with me that um, you could give certain rights to certain people to exercise your right for a consideration. For example, if I am an author and um, there are certain jurisdictions where my publication has not get into, but there are potential customers there. People or anybody can approach me for an approval to making that publication in those jurisdictions and pay me certain um, compensation for that right being exercised there. That is an example of royalty. So when you have a royalty being earned by a company, it is liable to withholding tax at 10%. If it's an individual, it is liable at 5%. Commission, consultancy, what you call co any form of consultancy arrangement, technical fee, service fee, and the likes, when they are being um, offered by an incorporated entity, it is 
liable to withholding tax at 10 percent if it's an individual it is at um, five percent when you have management fees being earned by an institution institution or a corporated entity it is at 10 percent uh, if it's an individual it's at five percent construction um contracts there has been a lot of debate front and back on that there was a time um it is five percent to an instituted uh, institution or incorporated entity but at present um it has been reduced to 2.5 percent while that of an individual is five percent then you have any form of contract that is not or business arrangement that is that is not uh, the same as all the aforementioned it is liable to with holding tax at the rate of five percent but let me take this much more further all that i've explained thus far relates to transactions done within nigeria as a tax jurisdiction if you now have an individual which is not resident in nigeria or an instituted i mean an incorporated entity not resident in nigeria or incorporated in nigeria but any income in nigeria depending on the nomenclature given to the agreement or the the content of that business arrangement we then inform whether it is a form of dividend it is an interest it is a rent it is um director's fee or whatsoever those rates will be applicable as aforementioned except those people are resident in jurisdictions that nigeria has um a tax treaty with so tax treaty is something that is a little bit more technical um i i think in the upcoming months um before the end of the year we will look at uh, we will dedicate um, certain section to addressing that vis-a-vis -vis, uh, what we call the the impact of what we call um the free trade zone and the africa uh, continental free trade zone impact on the um, business in Nigeria. I hope that addresses all your concerns, sir. Adeyoye. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. Um, any question from um, any other person? I want to believe that um, we have done justice to some of the um, issues you have at hand or you have in mind. If you still have any other thing there is still time for us to address in those concern please um this very time may not be sufficient to address all concerns should you after a um, section like this still have anything whether in the course of your work you want a second opinion on or it's just a personal quest or you are studying a material and something appears very intriguing to you you needed an opinion about that you can freely reach out to us we'll be glad to addressing those concerns uh with the intent of doing the profession proud right you can also meaningfully engage with us through any of our social media platforms the linkedin linkedin rather the um um the twitter instagram the I I icons and the addresses are there for you to follow and get across to us you could also visit our um website www.acp dot com dot ng um there is a platform there where you can um raise a request and um your request will be addressed um any other question um on the chat box you have some of those addressed there the instagram please indicate it there <laughs> Um, in addition to all of these, we've also had a lot of um, recorded sessions on topical issues um, in accounting, in tax, and um, auditing, and which is also um, stored on our YouTube uh, channel. You can go through it, follow us on YouTube, go through it, and um, make best use of those contents um if there is no question i would like to come back to um cousin to give us a final note uh on isa 510 before i address other guests thank you 
yeah um thank you very much um so um i think I mean, um, it's a 510 in one minute okay so basically it's a 510 is just talking about um initial um opening balance of an engagement is talking about the um opening balance as is coming from the previous period to the current period um the auditor having responsibility to ensure that um, these balances are free from material misstatements that could impact the current um, period so that is um the scope of um is a five thing uh, so basically um it's a five focuses on when an auditor is um, embarking on an audit engagement very for the first time thank you all right thank you very much uh cousin um falashade i believe you are there um uh, give us a one minute wrap up of um our content on tax services in february okay so for this month we, we are basically talking about tax what's next after annual returns and then what next after annual returns we should approach the relevant tax authority in applying for our tax clearance certificates and also expect that the relevant tax authority might get back to us as a result of by carrying out desk review or tax audits. Thank you. All right. Um, I don't know whether Vanessa is still there. Vanessa, are you there? Okay. Uh, while waiting for her, BC, can you give us a wrap up of your content in one minute? Um, well, content about the presentation of financial statement and the, the components of a financial statement and the items in it, likewise the element of it and the application as to how to um, prepare the financial statements and the regulation backing it up and who is also responsible for the preparation of the financial statements basically all right thank you very much uh we strictly want to uh work within the time allocated for this session it is um just for one hour 30 minutes uh thus far in the course of this month uh on audit we have looked at it's a 510 and as has been stressed this is a very essential standard that auditors must follow in the course of any and every audit engagement uh we have the content out I we urge you to peruse it we urge you to still have constructive conversation around in around this with your team so such that you could improve your audit process and you could have justifiable uh basis for expressing your audit opinion right we believe there is a lot of um um things to unravel around that uh, this session may not be enough but we will be available should you have any question uh, beyond this time we'll be glad uh, to addressing that um in terms of tax services uh after having filed annual returns the pe returns what next um we did emphasize that you should um start processing and engaging with the tax authority about the issuance of the tax clearance certificate um for of your employees is very critical right processes on how to what to follow how to go in about this what you need to do is as advised by each of the states right so you might need to engage with each state to understand what is obtainable in the states within your jurisdiction right it is also important um, that you start reviewing your prior year's financials as auditors will be engaging with you. You need to um, do an, a comprehensive assessment or a tax L check 
of every component of the financial statements to be double sure that adequately tax provisions that need to uh, be adhered to has been booked as it ought to be booked and the accounting entries has been done as it ought to be done. Uh, more importantly, if you are operating within the finance sector, um, the insurance sector, and every other uh, reporting entity, you might need to start preparing for um, the common reporting standard returns that is to be due around uh, May of every year, right? Um, if you have directors uh, within the employment of your company and you are sure that they earn incomes, other incomes outside their regular monthly employment, it might be very instructive for you to start preparing for their self-assessment returns that will be due in March. Also, if you run your own business and um, even as an employee, you have other streams of incomes other than your monthly employment by law you're expected to file in your annual i mean your self-assessment returns that will be due in um, march of every year um if you are in the accountant position um it might also be very essential for you to start preparing for the itf contribution compliance which is due by uh, april 1st of every year uh, maybe in one or two of our subsequent publications too, we might consider um, doing or writing something around how to drive compliances around that, right? Um, then uh, finally, you might also need to look holistically at your uh, financial statements and start making requisite compliance in line with um, IAS um, 12. That is income tax. You need to do your corporate tax compliances and um, related levies that may be agreeable on that. Then on financial reporting, we did look at uh, what are the components of the financial statements, how, what are the contents of each of the components of the financial statements, how does this relate to, relate to taxes and how does this relate to audits? What are the things you should get ready even as you are anticipating the visit of your various tax, I mean, your, your various statutory auditors? Then uh, we crown that up with um, deciphering between um, contract for service and contract of service. In summary, we were able to agree that a contract of service is the form of um, contract that leads to employment income, right? Wherein the employer has the dictate of the form, the structure and the nature of the engagement and how the services will be rendered. While the contract for service is a form of engagement where there are um, distinct processes, uh, the vendor and the vendee has distinct opinion about how the contract or the services will be discharged and every other circumstance around that. We finally looked at the tax implication of that. If you have a contract of service, um that will be tax implication of that will be um the consideration payable will be liable to pay you. and if you have a contract for service um the consideration payable on that will be accruable to um uh, withholding tax i believe with this we've been able to do justice to what we promised for february we do hope that um march will be much more enlightening than this we encourage you to stay connected, committed, and continue to follow us. And uh, we promise not to disappoint you and to always um, add value to us. I mean, add value as we have earlier promised. Thank you very much for staying tuned. I wish you all the very best and um, enjoy the rest of the day. Happy new month in advance. Uh, thank you. Bless you. Yeah, thank you very much.